Hello and welcome to St. Andrews, where we are a community of faith united by the love of Jesus Christ, building disciples through worship, study, prayer, and service. Let us turn our hearts and minds to worship God. Let us pray. In the reading of your word, may we be given light to see. May your word rest in our hearts, O Lord, and in our minds. And in so doing, may it transform us into your faithful people. Speak to us, Lord, for we are listening. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verses 1 through 25. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the, waves, for the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of perdition assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him a canopy. Thick clouds a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channel of the sea was seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He reached from on high. He took me. He drew me out of the mighty waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a couple of weeks ago we talked about the battle hymn of the Republic. And today's hymn is sometimes called the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. It was written by one of the people, some may argue the person, who started the, Re the Reformation, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, and he became frustrated with some of the practices of the church, in particular the selling of indulgences. With indulgences, wealthy people could give money to the church in order to release their deceased loved one's soul from purgatory. Luther himself would drop the concept of purgatory altogether as the Reformation progressed. So Martin Luther wrote up his 95 theses, or 95 points of debate, where he disagreed with the Catholic Church, and he posted them on the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg. This was intended to spark debate and hopefully to reform, uh, lead to reform within the Catholic Church. But such was not the case. Luther was sent what was essentially a cease and desist order from the Pope, along with the requirement that he recant his beliefs. 
Luther, who some may have characterized as a bit of a hothead and others might have just said he was passionate, burned the letter. This led to him being defrocked and excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church. These actions, along with some other stirrings, lit the fuse of the Reformation. The end result of Luther's action was a schism, or a fracture, between the Roman Catholics and what would become known as the Protestant Church, or the Protesting Church. We Presbyterians are part of the Protestant Church. There are so many great stories of the Reformation. It was a time of radical change as Luther and other theologians of the time began to ask questions about what is essential to Christian faith. What is essential in the practice of living out our gospel good news? And these weren't just minor tweaks to, practice, to our practice and theology. It was a total change. Church historian and writer Phyllis Tickle compared um, it to the different way that people sort out drawers when they're cleaning out. So some people say, I'm going to clean out this drawer. They open up the drawer, they look inside it, and then they just pull out what they want to get rid of and leave the rest essentially unchanged. The other method is like the Marie Kondo method. Yank the drawer out of the dresser, dump the whole contents on the bed, and examine it all. And the only things that make their way back into the drawer are the truly essential things. And only those are returned after they've been carefully examined. So the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther are using the Marie Kondo method of examining Christian faith and church life. They were throwing everything out on the bed, looking through it all, keeping the essentials, making intentional changes, and forming a new way to be the church. Everything was ripe for examination, from how we understand the role of the Bible in our faith, to what the structure and leadership of the church should be and do, and how the church should function. These early years of the Reformation were tumultuous, uh, filled with excommunications, exiles, breaking nuns out of convents in barrels that had held fish, Look it up, Luther's wife was one of those nuns, and many, many debates and theological writings. Now, Luther posted his 95 Theses in 1517. Twelve years later is when he wrote the words to this hymn. And it's a paraphrase of Psalm 46, but it examines Psalm 46 in the light of Christ. Because woven throughout are many of the essentials of what Luther and his fellow reformers used as anchors for what would become the Protestant church. Now the first line of this hymn, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, um, emphasizes the first essential that was kept in the Reformation. The centrality, dependability, protection, and strength of God. This echoes the words that we read from King David in 2 Samuel when he had received relief from those who had opposed him. David prayed, The Lord is my solid rock, my fortress, my rescuer. My God is my rock. I take refuge in him. He's my shield and my salvation strength, my place of, of safety and my shelter. Now, don't those words sound a lot like a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing? When Luther wrote these words, he was probably thinking about the way that God had provided physical protection for him um, from those in the Catholic Church that were seeking to harm him. But the idea of God as our fortress, our place of protection, goes deeper than the physical things that may threaten us. For we know that there is more than physical harm that can come to us. Some of the deepest wounds leave no mark on the body. In the hymn, Luther uses the understanding of, of the primordial foe, the, the prince of darkness, usually depicted as Satan or the devil in other places. And what is being fought against here isn't like the, the red guy with the horns and the tail and the pitchfork, for evil is not usually that obvious. 
Evil becomes more obvious when it is only when it is held up to the capital T truth. And that is the truth that is shown to us uh, through God in Christ. And that's what this hymn is. It's a proclamation of the triumph of truth itself. Truth with a capital T. The triumph of what is essential in our life of faith. The centrality and the ultimate strength that comes from God. Not what sometimes masquerades as truth, but instead is twisted by our inability to fully comprehend God. But the capital T truth is what is foundational to who God is. It's the mercy, love, forgiveness, and strength of God. This truth is what's proclaimed in the final line of the hymn, The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. It is because of our firm belief in the truth of God that we can proclaim that all these other things that seek to assail us, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual ills, are unable to overwhelm or defeat God. When we sing this hymn, we proclaim that God has the final word. God has won the battle. Evil in all of its forms is defeated. The war is won by God, even if the battle still seems to rage around us. And Luther captures that in the third verse. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. With the clearing out of all the non-essential pieces of church life during the Reformation, this hymn brings us back to the essential basics of who God is. That is among the reasons why it is called the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. It was sung by Swedish troops during the Thirty Years' War. It was sung by martyrs headed for their death. It was sung by people in the street. It was sung by us. It's become a steady rock, a steady rock of faith for all who face trials of any kind. It is an affirmation of the core of our faith. Indeed, a mighty fortress is our God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we were yours before we drew breath, and we still will be yours when the pulse of life ceases. In every fragile, reckless moment, we belong to you, O God. And we thank you. We thank you for the desire of our parents who gave us life, for the love we have received and the gratitude in our hearts. For we, we pray, O oh God, for the wounds that we carry, that it might open our hearts to the needs of others. May we recognize in your mercy the faithfulness that judges and redeems every human bond. And we lift to you now all that seems irreconcilable in our families, in our schools and workplaces, in your nation, in your church, in your world. We pray, Holy God, for those we identify as leaders in every sphere of life. We pray for our president and for all whose decisions weigh heavily on others. Even so, Lord, give us the courage to name ourselves as those whose responsibility is great. Teach us to act to tend the world you love, to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you made room for us. Redeeming God, stake your claim upon us now until we hear your gospel echo in each stranger's story and see your image reflected on each wounded face. We pray in the name of Jesus who unsettles our lives for the sake of your love. Holy God, hear our prayers. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the suffering. Honor all people as you love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.